Throughout history, the basic principles of siege warfare have not fundamentally changed. A castle, a walled city, a stronghold, they are designed to increase the survival odds for friendly troops and to reduce the mobility of the enemy. And to overcome them, they must be either starved into surrender or stormed by force. I'm Andy Nidell. Welcome to a World War II special episode about German siege techniques. One major factor in warfare is mobility. When the German 11th Army advanced towards the Crimea in September 1941, they found the main route blocked at Perikop Isthmus. The roads were mined, the railway tracks were cut to serve as anti-tank obstacles, and attached to them were remote-controlled explosive charges. Then came a barbed wire fence, flanked by anti-personnel and anti-tank mines bombs, and sea mines. More anti-tank obstacles followed, a ditch eight meters wide and up to three meters deep. Then another minefield, 15 meters wide, row after row of artillery bunkers, machine gun pillboxes, and remote controlled flamethrowers followed with a total of 13 kilometers of anti-tank ditches, 11,000 steel beams, and 14 kilometers of barbed wire. Soviet high command judged those defenses as formidable. The attackers overcame them within 48 hours, with the cost of heavy casualties. Yet, this was just one of many strong points, and what loomed on the horizon was Sevastopol, known as the strongest fortress of Europe. Quite literally situated behind a valley of death, the German assault troops would find more than just another obstacle in the field, they would find a siege. Unlike an open battle, a siege prolongs the war and forces the attacker to commit manpower and resources over an indefinite amount of time. For the German operational art of war, siege warfare is a nightmare. It is the antithesis of what is commonly known as Blitzkrieg. In fact, German doctrines actively forbid scenarios in which both sides simply trade blows. Victory in the field is to be achieved through movement, breakthroughs, and encirclements. A fortress, though, is designed to hold out and deny movement or breakthroughs. And although there have been major advances in tactics and technology, siege warfare still presents little room for operational art. So the Germans usually try to avoid lengthy sieges altogether. When German paratroops landed right on top of the Belgian fort Eben Emael in May 1940, it did seem like siege warfare could be sort of incorporated into mobile operations. Similar airborne and glider operations were undertaken in the Netherlands, Denmark, and Norway to take positions and bridges and neutralize defenses in advance. That concept, however, fell apart once momentum and surprise were gone in Operation Barbarossa. The vastness of the Soviet Union gave the Red Army time to prepare, to build up, to stock up, and to reinforce. The Germans could still overtake defensive positions in the field operationally as late as October 1941, but the large and strongly defended Soviet cities like Leningrad, Odessa, Sevastopol, or later Stalingrad had to be slowly and systematically ground into submission if they were to be taken until their defensive potential was lost. Key to the Wehrmacht siege strategies and tactics is the pioneer, the German combat engineer. It is his task to mitigate the effects of natural and man-made obstacles and to enable freedom of movement and maneuver. By reducing, bypassing, marking, and clearing obstacles such as minefields, roadblocks, and battlefield debris, mobility is to be restored to the campaign. The German pioneers traced their direct lineage from the Sturmtruppen of the Great War, who attacked enemy trenches with grenade bundles and flamethrowers. In fact, the German military term Sturm specifically refers to attacking entrenched defenses. During the Great War, the Western Front was basically one big four-year-long siege, and the German solution to try to overcome the stalemate was to send out aggressive breach and entry units to infiltrate Allied trenches. The Wehrmacht Sturm Pioneer took the technical aspects of the storm troops and specialized them. Like every other combat engineer, they naturally perform dual roles. The job is both building and destruction, repairing and disassembling. Pioneers can erect wire entanglements and they can cut them. They can build bridges, they can blow them up. They can crater roads or strengthen them. However, in keeping with the Wehrmacht's offensive spirit, much of their training focuses on the assault aspect of their mission to successfully create a route 
for other troops to follow and advance. The Soviet defenders embed their strong points naturally into the terrain. Guns are placed in stone pits and behind earthworks, inside timber or concrete bunkers, usually surrounded by rows of barbed wire. Supplies are stored underground, headquarters are in tunnels, and soldiers hold out in personnel shelters. They're also good at creating dummy batteries to draw German artillery fire or to bait infantry assaults against hidden machine guns. To overcome these defenses, the pioneers are extensively trained in map reading, range estimation, and battlefield reporting. Practice in field works and spotting of movement routes is of major importance, especially since the Soviets excel in camouflaging their guns. To break defenses, pioneers have flamethrowers, mine detectors, wire cutters, and demolition charges. One revolutionary device is the Holladung, a shaped charge that cracks armor and concrete especially well. But despite their effectiveness, the pioneers are a specialized force and they should not be carelessly squandered against strong defenses. So siege warfare also demands the application of brute force. The Great War showed that infantry was vulnerable against entrenched machine guns and enfilading fire. And even the resourceful pioneers cannot act when they are pinned down by suppressing fire. But camouflage machine gun positions are hard to spot and they're even harder to hit with long-range artillery. To fix this, General Erich von Manstein, who commands the German army in the Crimean campaign, advocated a modern solution in the mid-1930s and became known as the father of Sturm artillery. German infantry was to be supplemented by self-propelled assault guns, known as the Sturmgeschütze, or Stug for short. Designed with heavy frontal armor and a low silhouette, the Stugs are to go in with the infantry to attack enemy defensive positions, especially those which cannot be neutralized from afar. They absorb enemy fire and themselves fire high explosives against enemy strong points. Assault guns also act as mobile gun platforms, allowing the infantry to move and outflank the enemy. And once a position is surrounded and unable to be further supplied, its defensive value decreases very quickly. Stugs can also serve as mobile casemates for forward artillery observers. To get immediate information and estimations about the fighting, an experienced tactical commander is put into the armored assault gun. If the force encounters strong defenses, which have not been spotted or identified before, the officer can radio back to divisional artillery about new targets. These calls are gathered in the Artillery Information Center, where German artillery officers evaluate all reconnaissance reports coming from forward and aerial observers. They usually assign code names to geographical features, enemy strong points, or strategically important positions. Artillery batteries then continue to shell and harass those identified targets. But still, if especially tough resistance is reported, the Germans need to call in more specialists. June 1942, they assemble an enormous artillery force in front of Sevastopol. The 781st Heavy Artillery Regiment is brought in to break the Soviet casemates and bunkers with overwhelming firepower. Their mightiest instrument is Dora, the largest artillery gun in the world, though not in history. With an effective firing range of over 30 kilometers, the 800 millimeter railway gun is the size of an apartment building. The gun is designed to fire projectiles that can penetrate six meters of concrete and one meter of steel. Next comes the 600 millimeter Carl mortar. These huge guns need an excavation of 5,000 cubic meters of rock each to create a stable firing position. Down the list comes the Czech siege howitzers, the Quip 420mm Gamma Gerät from the Great War, and the French 194mm self-propelled cannons. The Germans set up over 200 batteries on a 35km front. They are to soften up the Soviet positions, literally. Even the sturdy Soviet bunkers that shrug off 75mm and even 88mm shells are not designed to deal with damage from upwards of 200mm. Smaller artillery batteries are also used to lighten the burden of the assault troops during the attack. And with counter-battery fire, they can suppress the Soviet defensive artillery positions or hammer into the counter-attacks of the Soviet infantry. A newish asset to siege warfare is, of course, the third dimension. But while the Luftwaffe is vital 
to achieving success in German operational warfare during a siege, it's either too weak or too inaccurate to destroy important targets. Stukas and tactical bombers can provide close air support and turn cities into rubble, but the Luftwaffe lacks a strong strategic bomber force to achieve lasting damage. Main targets for the Junkers and Heinkels are things like supply depots, troop concentrations, and civilians, as well as permanent defenses like batteries and forts. But their damage potential with high explosives and incendiary bombs is quite limited. All in all, breaking sieges remains a difficult task even in modern warfare. Sevastopol shows that any siege is an unwelcome drain on force and morale. The Wehrmacht aims at breaching the defenses through concentrated force and specialized troops. Aggressive infiltration techniques force the defenders into isolated pockets where they can be surrounded and neutralized. Everything is focused on keeping a momentum going that denies the enemy a chance to rally and strengthen his positions. But despite the Germans eventually capturing the strategically important city with those tactics, the victory is quite hollow. The eight-month siege has kept an entire army tied down while it has been very much needed elsewhere. Sevastopol has stood up to its reputation, inflicting terrible casualties on the attackers, who've had no choice but to throw themselves against the defenses, again and again, till the last position is captured. If you'd like to learn more about some other specialized German units, you can click here to check out our special about the Fallschirmjäger. And check out the Time Ghost Barracks to see our whole line of Time Coast, Time Coast, Time Ghost collectibles. There is some cool stuff there and some temporary special things even. And do not forget to subscribe. See you next time.